2,000 years ago, the Roman army had swooped on a cluster of islands they called Britannia. For the next 400 years, they imposed an imperial idea of order on its people. They built smart villas and fine bathhouses. The Emperor Hadrian had even constructed a wall that crossed from coast to coast to keep at bay the brutish chaos outside the Roman dream. But by the beginning of the 5th century AD, the Roman Empire was showing its weakness and it began to crumble territory by territory. Britannia would disintegrate and for 600 years, the people who lived here would watch as their homelands became battlegrounds, invaded and plundered by men from Scandinavia and Northern Europe, men who were hungry for land or with a glint of gold in their eyes. This was to be a time of upheaval and chaos, but out of it came much of the England that we know now, our language and our rule of law, a state religion and our faith in the market economy. This, then, would be the fourth age of Britain, a time when England would become wealthy and independent, recognised as one of the prizes of Western Europe. Pevensey Castle, near Eastbourne on the Channel Coast. One of the largest Roman ruins in the British Isles, and the site of one of the bloodiest episodes of our history. Pevensey had been built by the Romans in the third century AD, a defense against persistent raiders from the barbarian tribes of Northern Europe, among them the Angles and the Saxons. Over the next hundred years, these pirates became invaders. They started by taking back land in Europe, colonized by the Romans, and soon they were overrunning new territories. The empire couldn't hold. Rome consolidated its defenses on the continent and bit by bit began to withdraw from Britain. You can see from the sheer scale of these walls just how seriously the Romans took the Saxon threat. And as the legions gradually left one by one, for the people living here, that threat must have felt even closer. Then, in 410 AD, a bombshell. Emperor Honorius sent a letter to the cities of Britain declaring that they were now responsible for defending themselves. We were on our own. And it soon became clear that the Britannia, constructed by Rome, had little chance of surviving intact. Without the Empire's protection, Britain was a soft target. In the Saxon homelands, the tribes faced rising sea levels and warfare over remaining dry ground. It was only a matter of time before the Saxons were back on British soil. And sure enough, the earliest English annals back this up. We have an entry in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for AD 491, which says that the leaders of the uh, South Saxons, who had landed at the coast, stormed this castle and slew all the Britons in there. So clearly the people hid in here. Then this was stormed by the Saxons. In one sense, this story is typical of a wider pattern as reported in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is one massacre after another, one, one conquest after another. These chronicles, written about 400 years after the event, are some of the first formal British history. The chaos they describe may explain the real lack of archaeological evidence for human activity back then. Because of this void, these are often called the Dark Ages. But the cutting-edge science of genetics is yielding new clues, including compelling evidence for the scale of Anglo-Saxon immigration. Perhaps one of the most interesting and new types of evidence is DNA. 
the DNA of the Y chromosome that is only passed on in the paternal line suggests that uh, between 50 and 90 percent of males were replaced, um, expelled, killed or whatever by Anglo-Saxon immigrants. That is what that research is saying. So some complete families coming in, but also a large number of uh, unattached, dispossessed, warrior types, uh, young adventurers looking for a life elsewhere. This genetics proves that the Anglo-Saxons were here to stay, ancestors of the modern English. As they became established, the old Roman mindset, where people here saw themselves as part of the empire, now gave way to an outlook that was much smaller scale and centered on the family. It was a new kind of Britain. West Stowe in Suffolk, one of the earliest Anglo-Saxon settlements in England. Here, the new arrivals came with their women and children, not to wage war, but to set up home. Excavated in the 1960s and 70s, the buildings at Westo have been reconstructed on the very spot where they stood 1,500 years ago. Around 70 people settled here in these timber houses, and they soon started to cultivate the land and keep livestock. They left scraps of their lives behind them. A man's spear. A woman's brooch and her bracelet. Combs for their hair. Even a shred of fabric from someone's tunic. The Anglo-Saxons were pagan, so there's no church. But there's a new kind of building here a hall where people gathered for meetings, feasts and storytelling. And it's the hall that reveals what the settlers held sacred, a network of emotional ties they called kinship. These communal spaces held society together. The people who met in a place like this had no written laws or centrally organised religion. Their social glue was kinship. Loyalty to your kin group and knowing your place in it meant everything. These fiercely close bonds between extended families and friends helped ease the inevitable anxiety of newcomers, the feeling that you should always be watching your back. The clearest evidence we have today of this kinship of love and loyalty comes from the language that arrived here with the settlers, the earliest form of English. It's called English because of the Angles, um, who were one of the tribes that, that came over to settle in the 5th century. And so it was really a remarkably rapid establishment of English as the language of, of what we now regard as England. How much of that would, would we recognise today? Um, about a third of modern vocabulary is made up of Old English. Um, quite a lot of our normal speech patterns, the way we sequence words, um, is derived from Old English. And quite a lot of our modern English words for feelings and for love derive directly from Old English. Um, so, for example, if I were to say I love you in Old English, it would be each luviathe, which is really, you know, remarkably similar. And the verb to love, luvian, is, is Old English. But also other words, deorling, meaning darling, Heortan, meaning heart, mood, which now means mood. So whereas I think we tend to think of them as kind of running around wielding their swords, there is a much more intimate side to the Anglo-Saxons that gives a completely different perspective. From this language comes the first English literature. Stories told every evening in the hall. They continued as an oral tradition for centuries before they were written down. They offer a picture of Anglo-Saxon kinship and love and how the pain of banishment was their darkest fear. Few of them are more heart-rending 
than a poem called The Wife's Lament. In The Wife's Lament, the woman, she's cast out by her husband's family and she's been commanded to live by an oak tree, Ak Treo, in an earth cave, Eortrafa, to live out presumably the rest of her life in this frightening, um, terrible isolation. And it was a desperately awful situation for whatever reason to find yourself cast out of the community. It's about love and it's about loss and it's about loneliness. And that isn't really how we tend to think about the Anglo-Saxons. And it's interesting that it comes in the shape of a, of a poem that's uttered by a woman. Laments like this one must have served as a stark warning to anyone thinking about disrupting the cosy fellowship of the hall. By the end of the 6th century AD, what we now call England had been transformed by a wave of Anglo-Saxon immigrants. The land was governed by their ideal of kinship, their English language, their obscure pagan religion. England had been nearly 200 years without Christianity, the established religion of the late Roman Empire. Now people's spiritual lives were dominated by a number of pagan Saxon gods, like Tu, the god of justice, worshipped on Tuesdays, or Thunor, the god of thunder, honoured on Thursdays. Of course, those pagan names for the days of the week have clung on, but almost everything else about the Anglo-Saxon belief system was about to be reworked. Christian missionaries were streaming into the country, determined to save our souls and to return England to the one true God. This is Bosom in Sussex. In the mid-7th century, this South Saxon village found itself at the centre of a propaganda campaign, one that used scare stories to bring Christianity to the peasants out in the fields. No rain had fallen in the province for three years, and a terrible famine ensued, which reduced many to an awful death. Frequently, 40 or 50 emaciated and starving people would go to a precipice or to the edge of the sea where they would join hands and leap over to die by the fall or by drowning. But on the very day that the people here received the faith, a soft but ample rainfall refreshed the earth, restoring greenness to the fields and giving a happy and fruitful season. I have to say, I think it's unlikely that a mass suicide did ever happen. For a start, the land round here is flat and marshy. There isn't a cliff in sight. And the man who wrote the account was hardly an eyewitness. He lived 300 miles away and certainly never came to Bosom. But what this story does reveal is a winning formula employed by many of the missionaries who converted huge tracts of England to Christianity in just a few decades. This was a world where if your crops failed, you faced the very real threat of starvation. So for people living on that knife edge, the message of tales like this was powerful and persuasive. By the mid-7th century, the English church was here to stay. What followed now was a power struggle between the old pagan ways and the new Christian ones. And the battleground was not just at church, but within the kinship of the home and the purity of the bed. The church does seem to have introduced a different concept of sin to the Anglo-Saxons. And it was one that they obviously had trouble um, assimilating. For example, a man might take two or three wives and a woman could walk out of the relationship if she wanted to. Um, we see Anglo-Saxon clerics writing again and again saying, when will these people learn that they can't, they can't just sleep with women like this, they have to marry properly. Yeah. 
the Christian Church tried to legislate against these rather casual relationships between men and women. It introduced the idea of orfast, legally married. For better, for worse, the institution of marriage had arrived. And soon this new Christian morality collided head-on with the old idea of kinship as the soul of the community. The church was trying to control the way families were organised and inevitably over time, as you get into the later Anglo-Saxon period, there does seem to have been some weakening of the importance of kin and power was generally transferring to the church. So there was definitely a, a tension between kin groups and, and the church. All this sparked some spiritual confusion and never more so than when dealing with death. In the old pagan tradition, you buried your loved ones with a sword or maybe some jewellery, treasured possessions for their journey into the afterlife. The new Christian church ruled against this practice, but even so, some people hedged their bets and continued doing it. There are hints in the archaeological evidence that there is some anxiety about this new belief system and how it did or did not replace the old one. And that actually does focus on children. For example, at Barton in Humber, there's a 7th century burial of an infant with a little feeding cup, a pot, that's in the shape of a breast. It would appear that perhaps this child was having trouble feeding or something like that, and they resorted to a little feeding pot. It didn't work, the child died, and the two were buried together, the pot and the baby. The religious authorities tackled this culture clash by embracing the most impressionable in society, children. It was a policy that would mark the birth of British schooling and bring writing to the illiterate Saxon people. One of the ways the early church spread its ideas was by taking in young girls and boys, teaching them to read and write and versing them in the tenets of Christianity. The immediate aim was conversion, but the long-term fallout was to put formal education at the heart of any decent upbringing. Tyneside, its great icon, the Angel of the North, a symbol of industry and of God. Back in the seventh century, this manufacturing heartland was in the vanguard of the spiritual revolution and monastery after monastery was built here. The most famous was here at Jarrow. Little remains of the monastery now, only this tiny chapel, now part of a Victorian church. But it was from Jarrow that the English priesthood was to spark a revolution creating a brave new world of literacy and of writing. Of all the innovations in the 7th century, the arrival of writing is the most powerful and the most far-reaching. With writing come other things. One of them is literate government, the promulgation of laws that you can go back and reread and circulate, the ability to transfer property, with documents that guarantee the transfer. So the arrival of the word and the ability to store knowledge outside your own head, all of this has an extraordinary impact on the way life is lived. And even if you're not literate yourself, the impact will reach you very quickly. The hero of this story lived here at Jarrow, and his is a tale of an ordinary boy made good. His name was Bede. And as a small child in 680 AD, he was sent away to this monastery to be taught how to read and write in Latin. It was an opportunity that would be the making of young Bede. He was to become the best-known author of his age, one of the forefathers of British writing. I, Bede, was born on the lands of this monastery at Jarrow, and on reaching seven years of age, I was entrusted by my family to the Abbot Benedict for my education. I have spent all my life in this monastery, and while I have observed the regular discipline and sung the choir offices daily, my chief delight has always been in writing. 
Excavations of the monastery at Jarrow have revealed Bede's world. Basic eating and sleeping quarters, a fine Roman-style church, even the workshops where young novices like Bede would have first learnt to write. We have equipment that Bede might have used, a stylus, a 7th century oyster shell for holding ink, even a stone still bearing a monk's thumbprint used for rubbing out mistakes. Writing was Bede's life. Um, he was extraordinarily prolific. He wrote over 70 different books on an enormous range of subjects, ranging from science or philosophy through poetics to uh, religious commentaries to, of course, his great history of the English people. And this is not early medieval cobbledygook. It's good stuff. In Bede's case, you can almost see him waking up excited because he was going to be able to write again that day. There's a sense of exhilaration almost about this new found knowledge. But all of that comes down to writing and the culture of writing. So here at Jarrow and other religious communities, there is a culture of writing in the late 7th, early 8th centuries, which has not really been paralleled before or since. With Bede, literacy was here in British life for good. And from his work comes a vivid eyewitness account of the Anglo-Saxon homeland, a far cry from the terror and chaos of its origins. Britain is an island in the ocean lying northwest from Germany and Gaul and is rich in grain and timber. Peace and prosperity now prevail and the people have laid aside their weapons preferring the word of God to the arts of war. But the world described by Bede was about to come under attack. The first target, 50 miles north of Jarrow, Lindisfarne, or Holy Island, off the Northumbrian coast. Back in the 7th century, there was another monastery here, one that had strong links with Jarrow and scribes with a reputation for making the finest books in Europe, but not for long. The year was AD 793, and something looking very much like the apocalypse was hurtling across the North Sea towards them. This year came dreadful omens over Northumbria. Immense sheets of light rushing through the air, whirlwinds, fiery dragons flying across the sky. Then, on the sixth day, the harrowing inroads of heathen men made lamentable havoc in the Church of God in Holy Island by plundering and slaughter. The heathens in question had sailed from Scandinavia the Vikings. That raid here on the Holy Island had been bloody and brief, but it was to be the first of many. And soon people throughout Britain would be feeling the heat of Viking fires. By the eighth century AD, England was a Christian land one of the church's conversion success stories. But within decades, monasteries all along the coast had been looted of their holiest treasures by raiders from pagan Scandinavia. It was the beginning of a prominent Viking presence in British life. But it wouldn't all be rape and pillage. Instead, bloodshed would combine with an extraordinary flurry of integration and prosperity. Even today, many of us still have Viking blood. The islands of Orkney, off the northeastern tip of Scotland. They may seem out of the way today, but these straits are the perfect gateway to the British mainland. At the beginning of World War II, a single German U-boat attack in these waters took more than 800 British lives and Winston Churchill ordered the construction of these permanent barriers. But back in the 8th century, this place was much more vulnerable to unwanted visitors. Of course,
course, the people who lived here 1,200 years ago didn't have the option of sinking nearly a million tons of concrete and rock into the seabed. The intruders that they had to deal with weren't German U-boats, but Viking longships. The Vikings were back. And this time, they weren't just after gold and silver. Now, they wanted land. The Broch of Bursae is a tidal island off the Orkney mainland, and it's home to one of the best preserved Viking settlements in the world. The first major landfall between Norway and mainland Britain, the Vikings arrived on Bursae at the end of the 8th century. Here and all over Orkney, the existing local populations rapidly cooperated or got out. And now the Vikings set about making themselves at home on British soil. Well, there's clearly settlement from a very early period, the 9th century. And at that time, they were probably living primarily uh, on the cliff edge. Um, and then gradually, other buildings were built nearby. But there are certainly byers and there are barns. Uh, there's a smithy. Um, and they also began to build large houses, um, including a very large hall house about 20 metres long. Recent archaeological discoveries suggest that the Vikings were sufficiently determined to put down roots here, that they even brought their homes with them. Large timbers were being brought across from Norway. Uh, they were squared off at source in Norway so that they were easy to transport. It isn't impossible that they weren't bringing in some form of kit houses, probably not something that was very sophisticated, but bringing in uh, enough wood to build small wooden houses from quite an early period. From kit houses, the Norse settlers installed one Scandinavian luxury after another. There's also some rather unusual buildings. Um, in particular, there's one which is sometimes called a sauna, but essentially this was a heated building. There's stone-built drains, which they may have used not only as straightforward drains, but also to carry hot water around uh, and uh, under the benches that lined the walls and warm up the houses, warm up the bums of the people who were sitting on the benches. The evidence points to a comfortable, ordered life do-it-yourself kit houses, snug evenings in the hall, even a sauna. All of this a far cry from the usual image of Vikings as the most blood-curdling of history's bad guys. I'm sure they did pillage and they must have raped and they probably burnt people in their beds and so did everybody else. It was a fairly violent age. Um, what did for the Vikings' reputation was firstly that they were always reported by monks. Uh, it was in their interest to say these heathens, these pagans have come and they've done all these dreadful things, painting pictures of people with horned helmets, they didn't have horned helmets, or, uh, and their great dragon proud warships. A lot of these things are an invention. True, perhaps, for Orkney and parts of Scotland that remained peacefully Norwegian for more than 600 years. But further south on the mainland, the English seem to have put up more of a fight. And the invaders, Danish this time, showed little scruple about shedding blood. Before long, they began to focus on a prime British target the town of York. There came a large heathen army into England and fixed their winter quarters in East Anglia. Then the army went over the mouth of the Humber to Northumbria and soon they were at York. It was November the 1st, 866. The Vikings were massed outside the town, poised to attack. A contemporary account describes what happened next. The heathens fought the army at York, and breaking open the town, some of them entered in. Then there was an immense slaughter of the people there. But for the survivors, the onslaught was in some ways the making of their town. 
after the carnage, life here would never be the same again. And the Vikings started by giving this place a new name, Jorvik. In 1976, archaeologists started digging on the site of an old chocolate factory on a street called Coppergate. They knew they'd find at least some evidence of 10th century Viking Jorvik, but nothing prepared them for the scale of their discoveries. A whole street of wooden houses, their backyards, their cesspits, and above all, thousands of artefacts perfectly preserved in the waterlogged soil. Amber beads from a woman's necklace, a man's ice skates for frozen winters, a minstrel's pan pipes, dice for gambling, even locks and keys for protecting your valuables. And perhaps most telling of all, a handful of clues that show how the Vikings made a life for themselves in Jorvik, like this embossed hammer for minting coins. This is for a St. Peter's penny, a particular type of penny struck by Viking kings in York in the early 10th century. Very rare object indeed. And the design is very significant. And it says St. Peter's money. St. Peter is the dedication of the Minster Church in York. So if you like, it's the patron saint of York being invoked. Good Christian symbol. And yet in the middle of the design, you can perhaps see a sword, very much like a Viking sword. And right in the bottom, in the middle of the lower line of inscription, there's a thing pointing downwards that is thought to be a representation of Thor's hammer. I think that what this coined eye tells us is that within a couple of generations of the original settlement, which was fire and slaughter, the typical Viking image, what had happened was that the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings had actually got used to each other. They'd formed a hybrid population of Christian Anglo-Saxon and pagan Norse. So I think in York we have this hybrid society, an Anglo-Scandinavian society. This peaceful integration triggered a wave of economic growth. For the first time since Roman Britain, we started to mass produce goods, a sure sign of stability. And some of these modest items have survived in the archeology. span We started finding a lot of these in the Viking dig and we wondered what they were. And then of course the penny dropped. So what we're looking at are waste products from the making of these things, these wooden bowls and it works like that. Um, the bowl, the bottom of the bowl is spinning around and then a man with an iron tool is gouging out the inside, leaving just this bit in the middle. And when he's finished, just about the last thing he does, he goes snap and takes off this bowl core, throws it away and is left with his bowl, which is the standard eating equipment of the Viking Age. And of course, where are we digging? in the street called Coppergate. And Coppergate actually means the street of the cup makers. The Vikings seem to be catalysts for creating the economic conditions in which people are specialists, working in towns and supplying an enormous market. This vibrant market was the Anglo-Viking community's greatest achievement. A quantum leap commercially and a massive social shift. Jorvik was transformed from a tiny town with a population of no more than a couple of thousand to a large, noisy manufacturing city, home to 20,000 people. Cities like York would never look back, but you mustn't forget that the economic miracle of Jorvik began with a massacre. One by one, after bloodshed and battle, the small Saxon kingdoms that made up Eastern Britain also fell to Viking armies. For people living in those hot spots, integration wasn't always an option. And eventually the leaders on both sides came up with a political solution. In 886, a piece of sorts was brokered. England was divided into two along this line, Watling Street, the Roman road that runs from London to Chester. Where I'm standing now was English, and over there on the other side of the road, the territories were held by the Danish.
Although this division must have seemed rather surreal when King Alfred imposed it, for 150 years, this line more or less kept the peace. But this was no more than the flimsiest of political boundaries. And by 955 AD, the Saxons had won their land back, battle by battle, from the Danish. Now, from their stronghold at Winchester, the kings of Wessex held the whole of England. For the first time, this was a single kingdom with a single name. But it was a territory that had been wrought out of troubled times, and it would have to be governed with a fist of iron. A draconian rule of law would be enforced, backed up on occasion by the power of the church and the threat of divine retribution. The men at the top had a vision of what would make England and themselves strong, and the men on the ground would have to fall into line. At the heart of the New England, Pusey Vale in Wiltshire. A thousand years ago, the people here found themselves caught up in a sudden and radical social reorganization. It changed the shape of their land and the powers that governed it. When, when England was unified in the middle of the 10th century, the West Saxon kings were governing a territory which they'd never governed before. How do you deal with, with a, a kingdom which is of the geographic extent of mainland England? I mean, it, it's a very, very big place. You know, this necessitates a completely different mechanisms of governance and social control. The solution was a masterpiece of delegation. The kings divided their large estates like this whole valley, into dozens of smaller estates and distributed these among their most loyal and favoured lords. They were a new social class, and among them there were councils of men in charge of law and order. Local society was organised according to units which we call hundreds, and a hundred nominally means a grouping of a hundred households. And Every four weeks, you would meet at a known place in the landscape. And for us, this is a place called um, Swanborough Tump. It's a small mound, and the name itself means the barrow or hill of the common man, the barrow of the people. And this is the place where the Anglo-Saxons would have assembled to conduct their judicial affairs, to listen to maybe if the king had just issued a new decree, a royal official would read this out to the, to the assembled free, free men of the district. Dealing with every transgression, from petty theft to murder, the court's power of sentence was absolute and its authority often deadly. We know from early land deeds for this region that anyone convicted of a capital offence at Swanborough would be taken up this hillside to the highest point on the ridge for execution. What kind of crimes carry the death sentence? Well, pretty much the kind of range that you might expect in, in some senses, so, for example, murder or theft. But then, of course, crimes which relate rather more to, to the social situation of the day. For example, if you deserted a king's army while it was on service, then you could be executed for that, or for a range of sexual offences. And how do they kill people here? Well, the standard method is by hanging. So you can imagine on a site like this, two or three or maybe even more individuals hanging by the neck. And you can, of course, see the bodies hanging from the gallows from a considerable distance. It would have sent, I think, a very, a very powerful message about who was in charge at that point in time. It would leave you no doubt about that. In cases where guilt was more difficult to prove, the final decision was passed from the Hundred Court and placed in the hands of God. It was called trial by ordeal, and from the secular state's point of view, it meant using the church as a potent agency of control. This is Brixworth Church in Northamptonshire. It's the largest surviving Saxon building in Britain. Trials by ordeal took place in major churches like these. A terrible injury was inflicted on the accused. If you healed with miraculous speed, you were innocent. If not, it was read as proof of God's will. You were guilty and would hang. It may seem extraordinary today, but back then, trial by ordeal was viewed as a practical last resort. 
medieval society was a, a semi-hysterical society, people with very real everyday concerns about literally how the world ticked. So in such a society where um, religion very often is, is, is the, the contemporary key to understanding your, your world, you may very well believe in a general sense in the effectiveness of judicial deal. Trial by ordeal brought church and state together for the most extreme law enforcement. A favoured method was trial by hot iron. If you were among those assembled in the nave to support one side or the other, the grim theatricality of it all must have been compelling. It would have been a very, very dramatic affair. I mean, probably the first thing to, to, to hit you would be the, the, the smell and the noise and the sight. So all of your senses had come alive when you walk, where if, you, if you were to walk into a church where an ordeal was taking place. Your nostrils filled with the smell of hot coals roasting up the hot iron. The sight of the fire it, it itself, again, you know, the sight of a roaring fire inside um, a building, especially a church, a very dramatic thing, thing to look at. You can imagine a very, very tense situation, a lot of people um, very sort of concerned about what's going to happen. When the iron was glowing hot, it was placed on top of a wooden post. The accused was ordered by the priest to grasp the metal and walk with it for a full nine paces down through the body of the church. When you've put down your, your piece of red hot iron, your hands are immediately bound. Um, you then come back to the church three days later and your hands are unwrapped and inspected. If they festered, you're guilty, and if they've healed, which one would guess is pretty unlikely, um, then, then of course you're innocent. To understand what happened in churches like Bricksworth, we have to remember that a society that had weathered so much upheaval needed every individual within it to play the game. Anyone who broke the rules was a real threat to your stability and not to be tolerated. And out of this formidable law enforcement came the framework for a stable, prosperous England, based on God and on the land for which the people had fought so hard. And this is it, the best evidence we have today of ordinary working lives a thousand years ago. A rare document penned by a monk in 1020 AD. It's called the Julius Work Calendar, and it combines religion with a unique snapshot of living through the Anglo-Saxon year. The Julius Work Calendar was a religious document to learn the saints' days. It's in Latin but it's actually a sort of doggerel verse. Solomon Grundy, born on the Monday, christened on Tuesday. We can imagine these monks gathered round this single volume with a teacher in charge, getting them to recite it. And because it was uh, linked with the seasons, it's, it's, it moves out beyond the church into the world outside the fields. I think one can always imag almost imagine the scribe who was working on it looking out of his window, seeing the ploughman getting the, the, the fields ready and the, the pruning going on in February and so on right the way through. Here in the pages of the Julius work calendar are drawings of everyday 11th century people. Men drinking beer, shepherds chatting while they watch their sheep, Farmers working the fields and harvesting crops. A blacksmith preparing to shoe a horse. The Julius work calendar brings people alive, but working people, plucky little people. I particularly like the summer drawings because we see the pimples and the bald heads and some have beards and some don't have beards. Um, I think it's fair to speculate that the scribe, when it came to drawing, you, you can't help wondering if perhaps some of his mates had actually been included in these drawings. And most tellingly, it's a vivid picture of a world where the thing that would save your life and your soul was work. 
work calendar really sums up the fact that you do have to work every single month of the year. Life was a pretty unending grind for people in those days. Bones from the 11th century almost all betray terrible arthritis. Now that comes from people who've worked hard, who've labored physically all their lives right up to the very end. Work dominated everything, and that's what makes the calendar so f such a fascinating blend of, of spiritual faith, but the realization that the work ethic is what's going to get you through. For the people of Britain, this had been a long, hard journey from the collapse of Roman rule through centuries of chaos, violent invasion and disorder. And yet through that turmoil, cornerstones of our national life had been laid. A literate government supported by a powerful legal system, an established church, a sound economy. Now, of course, a success story like that isn't going to go unnoticed. And before long, the land inhabited by those hard-working English men and women would attract yet another wave of Viking invaders. This time, neither Norwegians nor Danes, but the Northmen, the Normans of France.